Instagram Live. Tyler Harris checking in. TJ. <laughs> What's up, On guys? the camera. Just got into LA. Just landed. Got picked up in the Maserati. Now we are headed out to meet up with uh, the All Mindset crew, record some content, do a podcast or two, and then uh, it's on and popping from there. We got a lot of stuff going on, but I uh, just wanted to say what's up. TJ wanted to say what's up. We are uh, cruising, cruising in style here. Trying to be safe. We've got a lot of stuff we're doing this weekend, so we're going to be coming at you with a bunch of live stuff, a bunch of not live stuff, trying to stay alive stuff. That is freestyle. Good job. Yeah. You're pressing your vibe. Yo, what up, guys? It's Gary Vee, and it's time for the Daily Bread. Give us our daily bread. I want the whole basket, because I'm a hustle till I get it or I'm in a casket. Passionate for providing value in every way. Not cashing in for providing value every day. Paying it forward, right thing, I'll do it till I'm dead. I hope you're hungry, because it's time for the Daily Bread. How you doing, oh, man? Boy, ain't playing games. <laughs> How you Poor doing? Poor guy, you can't even sip his drink, bro. Take a drink, dude. <laughs> That's great. How you doing? Thanks for making the pilgrimage out here, bro. Of course. Thank you for having us oh. out here, man. Are you kidding me, man? man? Dude, we're gonna have a great time. Thank you, man. Good to see you. Good to see you too. You doing okay? Yeah, man. Yeah, I'm good. I'm just saying because I know you, you. You took this uh, long trip, man. That no, drove. We're good. I mean, we're good. I'm glad to be here. You guys man. look great, man. I appreciate yeah, man. that. Yeah. We just changed the Chipotle. Making that happen. You're such a boss, man. You and TJ, bro. You and TJ. Respect, yep. respect the shooter, bro. Exactly. Respect the shooter. Exactly. <laughs> so is this how long you've been this one? Uh, we've been here for a year and seven months. Cool. So we're coming up on our two-year anniversary in July. Awesome. And then we have a second location in San Diego that's seven months new. Cool. And we got a scratch office that's run by my boy Brandon in Sa awesome. San Francisco. Awesome. Like literally less than a month. Really? Yeah. Really cool. yeah. That's good. That's awesome. So uh, we'll walk you guys in, man. We're having a, we're having a we're having a meeting right now, yeah, but sure. um, we'll interrupt the meeting. The yeah. team's excited to see you. I just did. I wanted to catch you before we walk in, so you're yeah. like not put on the spot because the yeah, guys yeah. are like really excited and so. For sure. Uh, what we'll, we'll do is this man. We'll, we'll we'll go in there. Um, I'm sure people would love to just say hi to you, yeah. and then I wanted you to address the team for a few minutes and share with sure. them some of your success and journey. And would love to. Yeah. yeah All right. Cool. You want you want to be somewhere so when I introduce you, come out for for footage, or, or is he already staying next to you? What, what's going to happen? Wow, good. Don't worry, don't worry about it, man. Don't worry about it. Cool. Let me just bring everyone up to speed of um, who this gentleman is, um, why he's here, how he's here, how I got a chance to meet him, and the partnership and support that he's been providing us, and vice versa. Um, last year in November. I ended up connecting with uh, Gary Vaynerchuk's uh, camp, and they had this huge event that people, we've already heard of Agent 2021, and it was specific for insurance and real estate advisors, as well as uh, travel and auto industry. And we all connected in about 18, 19 speakers connected at the Hard Rock Stadium. Uh, Deidre made that trip, uh, Chris Franchina, Matt, uh, Matthew Joseph, and Sarah Delzade. It is MJ, right, Matthew Joseph? Cool. I have like 40 names. Well, you got to go with Matthew Joseph if Chris, if Chris is plugged. So, so uh, MJ, Chris, Sarah, I, and Deidre. Um, Sarah uh, Shiva was to, was to join us too, but she stayed back to run the business and hold it down with Steve Court, so I appreciate that. But we went out to Miami, and before that trip, there was a lot of uh, social media excitement and discussions, posts, stories, etc., to where this gentleman's name, Tyler Harris, was branded and post on almost everything that was about this event. So I was pretty excited to meet this guy, assuming he's part of the, the contributors and faculty at this event. And as I um, went down and down the, the, the line, we got closer to the event, I recognized that he actually wasn't one of the speakers, but he had such a large enough influence and, and, and support of all these people that he's either met, if not personally influenced and directed through his um, social media um, influence, that really wanted and rallied for him to be on this panel as among the speakers. 
So I started researching about the guy and I recognized uh, he's from the financial services business. He's had a huge amount of success. I'll let him share with you the level of success and what he's been able to accomplish. But I, I definitely said this guy fits the mold to be one of the keynote speakers at this event. And um, when I went out there, I got a chance to see him and immediately when I saw him, I connected and introduced myself. And after that introduction, um, we ended up uh, exchanging information and, and building a friendship. And through that, we connected and said, hey, you know what? We would love for you to come out to our office and spend some time with our team. He's also one of the keynote speakers at uh, the Disrupt Tour that's taking place on June 1st at uh, Hotel Pasea, one of four or five keynote speakers. He's had a tremendous amount of experience. He's pretty selfless when it comes to helping share what he does. Um, there is no hidden agenda by the guy, and it's hard to find that in someone who's reached tremendous levels of success. So I appreciate that, uh, TJ. Always being behind the lens, but I, I, I recognize that he is just as significant and important with what he's doing. So, TJ, thank you so much for taking the time to come out here. And Mr. Tyler Harris, thank you for coming to, to spend time with our team, man. Welcome to Present Financial. Thank you. We're, we're grateful to have you. Well, I appreciate it. This is awesome. I mean, the fact that it's Friday, I'm looking at the wrong time. What time is it here? Three o'clock. And you guys are all here. That's like, that's that's step one. Like, that's awesome. And, and the environment that you guys are in, within this office, like I see it, maybe it's in the background of an Instagram story or maybe it's in a, in a Instagram post or Facebook Live or something, but you guys are definitely a part of something extremely special. Uh, and I hope you know that and I hope you um, realize that on a daily basis because I know you can get caught up in the day-to-day -day, uh, workflow and it's easy to let that type of stuff just become normal. Uh, but this is not normal, what you guys have going on here. Um, there are people that would die to be in an agency or in a just a company that they can come and have this type of atmosphere, environment, can grow with each other, are all young hustlers. And that's just, I mean, that's like the best, best, best environment to grow in. So I, I envy all of you uh, for, for being here. And that's why I said yes, that I would come. And I'm so grateful for Cena, um, the other leadership here. Um, it's so weird, I was just telling uh, TJ when we were rolling in, um, I said, it's crazy to think that, I mean, when was that event? Two months ago? So two months ago, I was like, I sent this guy a DM and now we're in LA and, and traveling out and, and speaking to the company and doing podcasts and planning these events and, and all these things. And it's just, it's just the law of attraction. Uh, I think that's what I'll just discuss real, real briefly. I'm really, really glad that I just stopped at that Chipotle and changed before I came in because I had sweatpants <laughs> and like a sweatshirt on. <laughs> I didn't realize I was gonna be speaking in front of everybody. So I'm really glad that I just changed. <laughs> that was a good call. TJ didn't, so. Um, but yeah, so just let me tell you a little bit about my story. Um, went to Clemson University, grew up, good home, all that good stuff. Uh, went to school, graduated in May, got married in June, started working as a financial advisor that July. So it was like a very fast, what I called like a domestication process, really. Um, and was doing ex extremely well. Um, loved my job as a financial advisor. I was with a huge firm, um, very independent in my schedule, but was out knocking on doors and, and making a bunch of money. And, um, and what came along with that is I was also becoming a huge jerk um, getting very full of myself. I mean, when you make like six figures your first year out of college, you kind of think you're the king of the world and that you're unstoppable and that there's nothing that can, that can, that can stand in your way. And over the course of the next maybe two or three years, everything just came tumbling down. Um, I'm actually now trying to figure out a way to create that for people like in a short, like a short uh, time span, like take my class and we're going to destroy your life in like 30 days. That way you can move on and have these things that have happened and, and grow and learn from it. Um, so we're going to see, I, I don't know if, I, I don't know if any higher education <laughs> institutions are going to, are going to take that on. Um, but that's what happened for me. I, I went through a crazy termination from the um, advising firm that I was with. Um, just, just the, the, shortest condensed version of the story I can tell you is that my dad was starting a business at the time and he sent me an email. He's like, hey, I'm meeting with uh, so-and-so uh, tomorrow. I just want to let you know. I have no idea why he sent me the email, but it was a friendly family friend of ours. And I was like, great, cool. Three months later, I get a call from our head of compliance and they had been doing this investigation and all of a sudden in a 15-minute phone call, I was like 176% of standard uh, within that job. 
And in a 50 minute phone call, they said, hand your keys to your assistant and leave the premises for selling away from the firm, which is basically, if you remember the FINRA Series 7 stuff, um, recommending an investment that the firm doesn't recommend. Um, but it was a family friend, my dad, I had nothing to do with any of it. But all of a sudden now I was under FINRA investigation um, and my only background career-wise was as a financial advisor, which I quickly learned that it's very difficult to get a job as a financial advisor when you're under current FINRA investigation. That's kind of like a big red flag. Kind of comes out in the first interview no matter what. Finally had one company that did hire me and then quickly realized kind of why they did. They were just kind of like, whatever. Um, so that didn't work out very well. Um, but that just kind of took me along this period of time where it was just sales job to sales job to sales job, going through this investigation with FINRA. I mean, they would call me up on like a Friday and they would say, hey, we need all your investment accounts, checking accounts, savings accounts, all this information from these three years and we need it on Monday. And I'm like, I can't get that off to you on Monday. I can get it to you next Friday, great. And then finally, after like two and a half years, I just I told the, the investigator that I'd been dealing with forever, I was like, hey, what's the worst penalty I can possibly get? Like, cause I didn't know, I mean, it was like jail time or like a huge fine or something. I was like, I have no idea. It's like, so what's the worst thing that can possibly happen to me? And she said, okay, we'll find out and we'll let you know tomorrow. They call me back the next day and they're like, okay, if you come back into the industry, you have to pay $7,000 and you're suspended from the industry for 30 days. And I was like, I've been out of the industry for two years now <laughs> with no plan on getting back into it. I'm like, I'm guilty. Like, sure. Like, I'll take it. I'm like, God, I've been dealing with you forever. So that kind of just started me on this downward spiral of going from sales job to sales job to sales job, really with this fear of going all in again and having it taken away from me um, because of that situation where it was just so abruptly just gone. Then I was at a business dinner. Um, I remember I was in Dallas, Texas, eating dinner with the co-founder of this company. I got a call from a, uh, a blocked number on my cell phone and answered him like, hello. And, the guy, and there was a guy and he said, um, he said, hey, hold on one second. Okay, no problem. Never came back. I'm like, that was weird. We're leaving the restaurant. I got another call from this blocked number. And I'm like, hello. And this guy says, hey, I got something you need to hear. I'm like, great. So he three-way calls my wife and says, um, he says, hey, hey, Lauren. And I'm like, Lauren? She says, Tyler? I'm like, like, what? And she hangs up. And the guy's on the phone. I'm like thinking, I'm thinking like ransom movies, like weird stuff. And I'm like, who is this? And the guy basically, in not so nice terms, said, I'm the guy that's been sleeping with your wife for the last seven months. So then that happened. And then that really spiraled me kind of out of control. And not, and not in the spiraled out of control like you see stereotypical like with drugs and alcohol, things like that, but just spiraled out of control and like lack of confidence, lack of purpose, lack of just why am I even here, that kind of deal. Like deep depression, got out of shape, just kind of like quit caring. Um, and did that for about two, two and a half years. Just was completely, completely, completely content with playing the victim and just wasn't taking ownership for anything at that point. I was just content with just like, hey, all these things happened to me. You know, my wife had an affair. I got terminated, you know, wrongfully from this job. Like, feel sorry for me. And I'm just going to sit back and be lazy uh, and not do anything about it. And then finally, one day, I just, I call it personal responsibility. You can call it take ownership. Um, there's a lot of things you can call it, but I just kind of had this aha moment. And I was like, everything that has happened to me or everything that I've done, I was in that situation that I was in, it was all my fault, all my fault. And sometimes people give me pushback when I, when I talk about that because I tell everybody, like everything that happens, like it's, it's all your fault. You control everything. And I understand there's things that can happen to you, especially things that can happen to you like as a child and different types of abuse type things. Like, no, that's not your fault, but letting it control you 20 years later, 10 years later, five years later, that you control that. And so for me, and, and I always get pushed back for, for whatever reason, it's always from guys about like the affair, like, oh, dude, that wasn't, that wasn't your fault that she had an affair. I'm like, yeah, it was. If I had been the absolute best husband in the entire world, best environment in our home that you could ever ask for, would it have still happened? Maybe, but probably not. So it was my fault. And I took ownership of that. 
I took ownership for the termination. Should I have known that that might raise a red flag? Had I, had I been more just observant of what was going on? Could I have prepared myself better for when it happened? Um, all of those types of things. Just took ownership for all of it. And it was the biggest encouragement that I can give anybody else is that I got myself into that situation. I was broke. I was in debt. I was depressed, I was out of shape. I mean, you name it, I was pretty much just the walking image of not, <laughs> not, not a good scenario. And I got myself there. And so if I got myself there, I could get myself out of it. And that's really what I started doing. I just started, I call it waging war uh, on personal change, but just made it my mission to start with personal development and start growing and just start auditing all the things that I was allowing in, just all the things that were coming out of my mouth, the people that I was surrounding myself with. Um, I had some mentors come into my life at that time, uh, which is not coincidental. Uh, it was because of that, that mind shift. Um, and those mentors really breathed life back into me, um, saw more in me than I saw it myself at the time. And that was exactly what I needed because my confidence was destroyed. Like if a male that goes through that type of divorce type situation, it, it messes with your confidence in a big way. And in South Carolina, South Carolina is a weird state. You have to be separated for like a year before you can actually get divorced. And that, I was trying to make it work. Uh, but the third time I found out that they were still together, I was like, I can't be your husband if you have a boyfriend. <laughs> Sounds funny. It's not that funny. But, but it's funny now looking back. And so that's the, and, and I can laugh about it now because of the fact that like, I know that those things happen for me, not to me. You guys have all heard that, but it's so important. And I am the person that I am now because of that. Like I'm the I'm the husband that I am now because that I because of the fact that I went through that divorce. Uh, I'm the father that I am now because I went through that. I'm the business person now that I am uh, because of, of that termination that I went through. Like all these terrible things, I'm so incredibly grateful for them because they made me who I am. And and that's the biggest encouragement that I can give. For anyone that's going through anything or has gone through anything, like use it. Like use that to propel you forward, not use it to let you just stay where you're at and stay content. Um, and like myself, playing the blame game and, and allowing that situation uh, to own you. So took ownership. That very next 12 months, so I, I mean, I'm I'm, li I'm literally dead broke. I had to borrow the money to get started in the business that I got started in. Um, from one of my business partners and when the other business partner now found out <laughs> he was so pissed because they do not do that uh, but I was like dude I don't have money uh, but I promise you I'll make it and I'll pay you back real quick which I did like in a week um, but I had to borrow the money to get started in this in this business and was just flat broke and just put my head down and absolutely went to work and knew that I could work myself out of that situation um, and, and that to me is the ultimate encouragement is that you can work yourself out of any situation. Like the only thing that works is work. Um, I've never ever come across someone that told me, hey, I was going through this difficult time. I went all in and just worked as hard as I could and it got worse. <laughs> like, like it just never happens. Like it just never does. Um, and so that's what I did. I just put my head down and just, just worked harder than I ever even even knew was possible really and in the next 12 months made a little over three hundred thousand dollars in commission um, like three hundred thousand it was like three hundred three thousand like adjusted gross income on my tax return uh, that next 12 months 12 months later uh, a little over 450 it was like 456 12 months later um, it was like 656 657 and that was last year uh, now going into this year you know looking you know beyond that um, but all those things happened seemingly so fast, but it was because of all the things that led up to it. And it was because I just, at that time, had a sole focus on what exactly I wanted to accomplish and just absolutely just ran after it um, and attacked it. And now, you know, fast forwarding, I mean, this is, this is all happening within the last three and a half years. I don't want, I'm like, it makes me so uncomfortable to like, see view like for me to observe someone else observing me with this man walking around with a camera <laughs> like it's so incredibly awkward I was trying to I was trying to explain it to I was trying to explain to someone the other I was just trying to explain to my wife the other night uh, I got home and she was in bed and I went up to her and I was like and I said babe I said just imagine you're ordering dinner at a restaurant and someone comes from like around the corner, like they don't even know you're, they don't, like they don't even know he's with me. And all of a sudden I'm in the middle of ordering and he's just like, 
And the person, the, like the waitress, like she's like, has no, <laughs> has no idea. Um, and so I'm, I'm extremely cognizant of like how weird all that, that stuff is. And I say that because I want to make sure people understand that I am just you on the other side of the camera, like probably worse than you on the other side of the camera. It's just, I happen to have this incredible guy that, that follows me around and, and records a bunch of stuff. Um, but the reason we started doing all this is because what I knew happened over that two, at that point, two and a half years uh, was not normal. And that the biggest mistake that I had ever made at that point in my career was not documenting that journey of that first 12 months of going from being absolutely broke to making over 300 grand. The reason I didn't is because I just had my head down and was just hard at work. Uh, I didn't post a single thing on social media for like 18 months even mentioning the job that I had or the career that I had, like at all. I just didn't want, just didn't want, I'd, I had gone through so many failures. I didn't want people to just like have this idea of like, oh, here's, here's the next thing. Like here's the next thing he's going to do and, and not go all in on. And, and which reminds me, when I was playing that game, that victim mentality of, of blaming everything on other people, when I was going from sales job to sales job to sales job, I, I created this scenario myself where I wouldn't go all in, wouldn't work at it 100% so that when I got fired or so that when I quit, I had the easiest excuse ever. I would just sit back and be like, yeah, that didn't work out because I didn't try. Like, if I would have tried, obviously I would have killed it, but I didn't try. And so I could use that always because it was just this fear of, again, going all in and actually trying and failing. And so once I took that off the table, I just I didn't document it. And then what I knew from there forward was the second biggest mistake I could, I could make was not documenting those next few years. And so it was January 11th of 2017. Yeah, so January of last year. Um, was the first post that I ever did um, documenting any of this craziness. And I can remember it like it was yesterday because like 90 seconds later, my wife called me and she was mortified. Like, what are you doing? (laughs) And it talked about income and talked about like what I was doing. And and she's just like super humble and like didn't want our friends to see it and like think weird. I don't know. I was just like, babe, I need you to trust me for like six months. I think I have some idea of what I'm doing. I've been watching this Gary Vee guy like religiously. Like I think I have somewhat of an idea of what I'm doing. Uh, you may want to unfriend me or unfollow me, <laughs> but it's going to get weird. But six months, like just, just, I promise you. And so I just started documenting everything at that point. Um, and at that point, like the the big thing that I love explaining to people is like TJ wasn't there. Like it was just all with the phone. Like what a lot of you guys are doing. If, way less than what you guys are doing. Like, it was just me in my car with a little uh, windshield suction cup mount by myself, and I would set goals on Sunday. For me, I used it as an accountability tool, um, and I would highly recommend you guys looking into doing this because on Sunday night or early Monday morning, I travel three to four days a week, always down in Georgia, so I'd be driving down to Georgia, and I would hop on. I always did live on Facebook. That's why I built Facebook bigger. Um, in the beginning, I would jump on there. I'd say, hey, my goal this week is to sell 75 life insurance policies in four days. Keep you guys posted on what happens. Day one, Monday comes around. I'd kind of jump on there every now and then. But at the very least, I'd jump on there at the end of the night. I'd say, hey, day one's done. Sold 13 policies today. So I'm behind on my goal of 75. Day two, I'd jump on there a couple times throughout the day. At the end of the day, hey, day two, I crushed it today. Sold 37 policies. I'm at 50, so I'm right on track. I'm actually ahead now. Day three, day four. And it was just the law of attraction for me. Like I was just attracting, I I was saying the word 75 policies like over and over and over and over to the point where like people, I'm getting on Facebook Live, they're like, where are you at towards your 75 policies? People are sending me messages, like direct messages. Like, hey man, I think you have like what, 11 more today you gotta get? Like, hope you crushed this last meeting. I'm like, this is crazy. Well, what would happen every single week is I would recap at the end of the week, be driving home back to South Carolina, and I would end up with like 76 or 77 or 75 on the dot. And every time I'd be like, well, what if I said 85? Crap. <laughs> but it was, it was talking about it the whole week. And, and for me, that gave me the ability and, and my encouragement with that. 
it gave me the ability to document, but also remain focused on what was bringing in the income, which was actually selling something and doing something. You can get really caught up in this stuff, and it's my sole focus, especially right now, is not getting caught up in all this stuff, the social media stuff, and have it take away from what brings in the revenue and what brings in the commissions and what <laughs> pays for all this stuff. And so for me, that was the best way to do it. And because of doing that, people just started watching. And I just started building relationships with these people. Like people that, like I'm extremely introverted. Like to stand up here and talk is extremely, extremely uncomfortable for me. Um, to meet someone in person, like to, a networking event for me is like my version of hell. <laughs> I'm telling you, like I, I will, cr I would like crawl under this desk and just get on my phone and just pretend like I'm not there and then like come out two hours later when everybody's gone. Like I just I hate it. I hate small talk. I just don't like it. But for some reason, for some reason that, um, that environment through social media, when someone comments or someone sends me a message and I message them back and now we start this dialogue and a lot of them will end up talking on the phone and different things, I don't know why, but for some reason I just connect on a much higher level. I don't know if it's maybe that I have time to respond <laughs> when they're sending me a question or sending me a comment, something like that. Uh, but it's become extremely important for me and has made me a better person, which is weird. You, people love to talk about how social media is making people worse and, and making connect, way less connections and people aren't having real conversations. I think it's completely false. Like I am a much better person and have way more connections with way more people because of social media. It's just in how you use it. Uh, but so that next year and a half, what's well, been 13, 14, 15 months now, I've uh, just been documenting everything. And obviously it's gotten bigger and, and more professional somewhat. Um, I mean, bringing TJ on board was, was huge. And, and bringing TJ on board was another example of law of attraction. Uh, I mean, a crazy, crazy example. I put a Facebook ad up saying I was looking for a, an apprentice, uh, a videographer. And the day I put it up, like 30 minutes later, I saw this guy follow me on Instagram, which I just happened to see it, happened to click on TJ, was it TJ Muscle Body Naked Photo? builder or something um, happened to click on it he had awesome photos on there that he had taken I'm like huh I wonder if he does any video work so I sent him a DM he had seen he had seen one of my posts by searching a uh, hashtag uh, ask Gary V because he was looking for a video to send to a friend of his and he was gonna DM me I DM him first he was on a plane he got off the plane he called or he messaged me back called him that night we talked for an hour and a half I was like, hey, man, I'm looking for this. By the way, do you, uh, you happen to know who Gary Vaynerchuk is? And he's like, I'm listening to the Gary V, uh, or the, what was it? What book were you listening to at the time? The Ask Gary V book, uh, audio version, like, while we were talking. Um, and so within 10 days, seven days, made a decision to, to fly from Maryland to South Carolina, and now we're together 24-7. Sounds like a love story, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> But, uh, but, that, but again, it's just the, the law of attraction and putting, these, putting this good stuff out there and knowing that that's all that can come back uh, is that reciprocated. I've, I've learned, especially recently, that the universe will never, ever, 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 ever be in debt to you. Um, and it all comes down to your intent. That's the reason why I don't monetize anything on my social media. Uh, I don't sell anything. I don't even monetize my YouTube channel. The other day we found out that... Um, we found out that Spreaker, who I do my podcast through, that someone had clicked a monetization button, and we clicked on one of my podcasts, and it had an ad that pre-rolled, and it was like, like code level one thousand in my office, like, like who did this? Like, what? We can't have ads running. We're talking about not monetizing. Like, we take it to an extreme. Like, we don't. We are one hundred percent doing all of this social media stuff just as a way to add value, as a way to impact people's lives lives and for me is as a way of paying it forward for that period of time where those mentors came into my life right when I was in that fragile 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 um, time period of making this shift and taking uh, personal responsibility um, it's just a way of paying that forward and so that's why we do all this crazy stuff I love that you guys are doing the exact same thing um, it, it became a, a huge recruiting tool I mean for us uh, from from a um, from our company standpoint because people were watching these Facebook lives and watching me sell all these policies every day 
And they were like, well, we want to do that too. So, I mean, there was a period of 90 days where we hired 41 people all through my Facebook. Um, 41 people in 90 days uh, that just had randomly seen a Facebook Live here or there um, and now are, are agents of ours across the country. Um, but that is all from one retargeted Facebook ad um, that we target people that have watched any of my content. Um, and, and for me, that's like the ultimate form of paying it forward because it's the same job that I do every day. And so I know what it can do for someone. Um, and so that's the exciting thing about what you guys are doing here. It's, it's very, very similar. It's oddly similar uh, to what you guys, the environment that you guys have here uh, and that has been created here. That's why I'm so excited to be here. Um, but the event that's coming up, it's going to be huge. Um, I don't really have any words of wisdom or great things that you can take other than the fact that like, I'm just a absolutely, well, I'm just a, I'm just a normal human being um, just trying really hard. <laughs> like that's it. Like my favorite word in the English dictionary is extraordinary, extraordinary. It's the, it's the biggest, most, for me, most encouraging word there is, is because if you break it down, you've got extra and you've got ordinary. So ordinary is just those simple things, the things that you know you're supposed to do, the things that they tell you to do, the things that are just normal. They're ordinary. It's the extra that makes the difference. So it's not that you have to go out and invent some new way of doing something. It's not that you have to you know, be the first one that ever sold this type of product in this particular way or found this niche that you're all of a sudden crushing. Like You just have to do the ordinary stuff that you already know how to do. You just got to do more of it than the person sitting next to you more of it than the person in the office next door. Um, and that, for me, was the greatest encouragement because I was like, I'm not really anything special, but I'll work really, really hard. Uh, and from the very beginning, that was kind of like my, my deal. Like, my close ratio was super low in the beginning. But I worked so ridiculously hard, I would come back at the end of the week, and, and my now business partners, but at the time, bosses, they, they would ask me, they're like, hey, how many life insurance policies did you sell this week? I'd be like, 120. I'm like, booyah. And they'd be like, well, how many people did you see? And I'm like, 500. And they're like, that sucks. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, what? I sold more than everybody. And I, that was just my whole thing. I was like, I'll figure this you know, training. And I'll learn the stuff down the road like as I go. But I'm just, if my close ratio is 20% and yours is 90, I'm just going to go see five times more people than you are and beat you every single day. And um, that was just kind of like the way I rolled. And then obviously now over time that has gotten way better. Um, so we're able to be a little bit more uh, efficient. But at the end of the day, like people ask me all the time, they're like, well, how do you sell so many life insurance policies? Just to give you an idea, so you guys know how many life insurance policies people sell. I sold 2,300 life insurance policies last year by myself, one-on-one, -on -one, face to face. Sold over, over 7,500 in the last three years. Face to face, one-on-one, -on -one, by myself. Um, three weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, I sold 182 or 187 in, in uh, four days. Um, but people are like, oh, how'd you do that? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Get on my Facebook Live when Cena jumped on there at 12.15 in the morning, my time. It was like 9.15 here. But I was, I think it was on Instagram Live, and I'm walking out of a meeting. It was 12.15 in the morning, and I just sold 15 policies to a group of people. And they're like, well, that's, that's how. That's why. I'm like, you just work when other people aren't, like doing the things that other people don't want to do. Um, that's what I like about our system. That's what I like about just the financial world being able to put in the work and then get those results was exactly what I needed in that tough time. Like I needed something that was transactional. I needed something where I could put in some effort, get a result, put in some effort, get a result. And it just kind of fueled this fire uh, within me that just hasn't stopped. Um, but I'm super excited to be here. I'm uh, honored, honored to be here. These guys are awesome. Uh, I haven't met a lot of you, but I've met uh, quite a few of you. Um, or followed you on, on Instagram, maybe done a little stalking on Instagram. Um, but I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled for this event coming up. It's going to be awesome. And uh, the lineup that we have and just all the stuff that you guys got going on here. I just want to reiterate one more time. It's not normal to be in a career where social media and doing podcasts and getting on lives and doing that is not only like um, encouraged but like even allowed so like it's a super incredible environment that you guys have here that other people would kill for um, especially in this industry especially in this industry because uh, it's such a like we said traditional just old conservative industry 
um, that I guess someone around here is trying to disrupt. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, and you guys are going to do it. And I, and I look forward to watching it. And I have, have been enjoying watching it so far. So. Awesome. Thank you, Ty, man. That's awesome. <laughs> So, Tyler, before you, uh, before you take a seat, I, I know our team has a lot of questions they yeah. want to throw you away and pick your brain. I much prefer um, I'm sure people are also extremely ecstatic to have, to have heard your story. I mean, you shared so much that I didn't even know. Thank you for being transparent and, and just being real. You know, any questions? Yes, Claudia? Obviously, we're all dying to know. How do you prospect? How do you write something? My biggest advice that I give to people especially in financial services, is to find a niche and go all in on building your systems around serving those people. And so in that, that was just all by trial and error and banging our heads against the door a million times and going into these places and getting shut down. And then like, well, what if we change this up? And so whether it's first responders, whether it's teachers, whether it's high net worth individuals, like whatever that niche is, getting as narrow as humanly possible and then building everything around it, to me, it's the ultimate form of respect because you're delivering a message to that person in the way that they can best receive it because it's the way that they're just used to receiving every other message. Like it's, it makes it to where it's crystal clear and so they can make a buying decision very quickly because you're, it's like you're speaking their language. It's literally like walking to someone that speaks Spanish and trying to speak Chinese to them and wondering why they're not buying. It's because they don't understand, like they don't get it. But when you walk in there and you're fluent in their language, then every, it, it takes down all these barriers and all these walls that they've built up around salespeople for years and years and years and years. Um, so for us, it's, it's that. And, and a lot of times, I, I talk about this with uh, realtors, with uh, real estate agents, and getting super narrow. So like, it's not just like, hey, I, I work on the east side of town or hey, I work with just first time home buyers. No, it's like first time home buyers on the east side of town that are within 100 and 200,000 price range, uh, ranch style homes, like whatever that is and becoming the expert in that. So that if anybody comes up in conversation, oh, you're a first time home buyer, you're looking for some of the east side, oh, you gotta tell the Cena, he owns the first time home buyer market on the east side of town. You know, whatever that means for you and what you guys are, are doing, it's just getting crazy narrow uh, with, with the niche. Um, and it gives us the ability to go in and really, um, I, won't, I wouldn't say kind of own the room, but it gives us the ability to, to set the temperature, I think is a cool word that, we, uh, that I learned recently from a guy named Jonathan Parker. TJ's head just popped up right when I said that. Because just, we, we just had a conversation with a guy Friday and he talked about this idea of setting the temperature. Like every room that you go into, like you set the temperature. You don't allow everybody else to, to have whatever's going on in their life to affect you. Like you set the temperature for the entire room. We 100% um, set the temperature. We tell them exactly what's about to happen. Um, and again, it's respect and it earns their trust really, really, really quickly. Every week, right? Yeah. And, yeah. You're, and like when you first got on Facebook, you go live, you call yourself out on Monday, and like, <laughs> uh, it, it's really easy to see how it could be an accountability tool mm -hmm. because you called yourself out publicly, like to the world, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. You're gonna do it, and nobody wants to like fail and stuff. But being as transparent as you are, were there ever times where you had to be at the end and be like, guys, I said I was doing 85, I did 60. Did the very first week? freaking week that TJ was with. <laughs> <laughs> the very first week and I was so angry um, you know that's funny uh, it's a great question it's, it's so funny because I think I gained more points in credibility that day than if I had doubled what my goal was because I think my goal that week was like 50 and I did 47 and I and I got on Facebook live and I'm like look didn't hit my goal am I happy about it no but am I gonna lie about it? Like I could have gone on here and said I did 70, crushed it by 20, and no one would have ever known. No one would have ever known. I'm like, but I didn't. I did 47, and it freaking sucks, and I'm really pissed off at the moment. I'll be fine tomorrow. <laughs> no, a bunch of times, bunch of times. Yeah, but it just happened to be the first freaking week of the vlog, and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Um, yeah, it's happened. It's happened a bunch of times. Um, I I try now to hedge it a little bit by like at least going into my first meeting the first day of the week so I can kind of gauge kind of the vibe 
if it's going to be a really good week or not. Before you call the goal out? Do what? I'm, yeah, I've done it a couple times. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, let me just see what's, you know, let me just see what this group's like before I come in there and like throw out a hundred and just like goose egg. But, um, but yeah, it happens all the time. But I think that's, but that's this whole idea of transparency and authenticity in social media is is it's such a important trend that needs to continue. Um, but the funny thing is, everybody loves to talk about transparency until it's time to become transparent. <laughs> Like, it's, it's cool to talk about, like, oh, I wish Cena would be more transparent when he's doing this. But then when you are on there, you're like, oh, crap. <laughs> like, oh, now I get it. Um, and so, but I think it's the only way. And, like, I've, I literally had a guy the other day that messaged me on um, Instagram. And he said, hey, man, how do I be more authentic? <laughs> I was like, my head just exploded from the complexity, the complexity and the simplicity of that, of that question. Um, but, yeah, it's just being, yeah, being honest. Happens, happens often. So when, um, as you were starting out, you know, this career and you were doing a lot of things and, you know, some of them didn't work, what was your main takeaway, like, that you were doing wrong that, you know, you wish you could have known? I wasn't working. I wasn't, I just wasn't working. Like, I, I think we did the vlog, um, that first week and he had asked me some questions and one of them was like, what would you tell, uh, your former bosses? I was like, fire me faster. Like, I just wasn't working. Like, I was literally, I was just, like, trying to find the best salary plus commission that I could coast on that salary for a little while and just continue to play this, like, blame game and just coast it out until I could find something else. Um, That's why I love, that's one of the things that, like, when Cena talked about at uh, 2021, when someone was talking about, like, well, how are you paying these people in commission and versus salary, and how are you able to recruit and this and that? I loved what Cena said because it's just the, it's the exact frame of mind that I have. I'm like, we because all of our agents, it's 100% commission only, and I don't know what you guys are here, but like that's, yeah, I mean that's like that's the only way now, the only way I would ever want to be, and it's the only way I would ever hire someone, at like what like anyone that would contest that it's like their reasoning would be a integrity issue. <laughs> like, like, well, why would we have to pay you for not doing anything? <laughs> why do you, like, explain to me why we should pay you something up front before you ever bring any revenue in. And like, their answer to that would be very awkward. Um, but but with that, when that guy asked that question and, and it was the way Cena answered it was perfect, but but my whole thing is like go out and create a environment where you have people that succeed and then make a success story out of those people to recruit other people to come in and, and, and do the same thing. Um, but that's what I was doing. I was just coasting off salary. Like I, I wasn't concerned at all. I probably didn't even know what the commission structure was. Um, cause I wasn't concerned about ever getting, ever getting in it. And I was, just, but I was in a bad mental place. Like I was, I was, I was not in a good mental state. Uh, at that at that time um, I think one thing to note though there was that I kept on having this mentality of whenever I find what I'm passionate about then I'll you know really work hard like I just can't get passionate about selling these human resources outsourcing services which was one of them that was one of the worst um, and I was like who you know who can get passionate about this so I was just kind of coasting I went to an event with Eric Thomas uh, and Gerard Adams. Um, it was the first time I met TJ. It was at that event. It was in December, and one of uh, Eric Thomas's main business development guys named CJ. He got up in front of everybody and he said, "Hey, are you chasing hustle or are you chasing?" And I was like, "Passion." <laughs> He's like, "No." <laughs> Crap. He said, "Are you chasing gifts?" And I was like, "Wow!" Like I never thought about it that way. Like, are you chasing? passion are you chasing hustle are you actually chasing your gifts because passion like you can become passionate about something you can lose passion in something in everything relate no different from relationships to a job to a hobby to a team like whatever you can become passionate you can lose passion but your gifts are your gifts like you're born those are the things you're born with like your talents skills and abilities and a lot of people are like well i don't know what i'm gifted in a lot of times i just tell them like what 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 can you do quickly that takes other people forever or what can you do for like six hours and you look up and you're like, oh crap, it felt like 20 minutes just went by. Like those little things that you're just gifted at. Like some people are gifted at being able to talk to other people and sales is like the perfect uh, thing for them. Um, 
but you can become passionate about operating out of your gifts. And that's what I've realized is that like, I'm sorry to ruin this if Cena has been telling you guys this, but like, there's nothing passionate about selling life insurance. <laughs> that may have been like the discussion right before I walked in was like how to be passionate about selling life insurance. <laughs> but but for me, it's just like this, it's this thought that so many people have. It's like I'm just not passionate about it. It's just an excuse. It's just an excuse. You may not be passionate about what you're doing on a day to day basis, but you can be extremely passionate about what that affords you the ability to to do. And for me, that's all this. That's this social media stuff. Like it gives me the ability to go impact tons of people's lives because I sold 182 policies that week. Like, did I like sitting down with those same people that ask the same questions and I say the same thing over and over and over and over? I mean, thousands of times a month, thousands and thousands of times. No, I don't love it. I don't like, I don't like wake up and I'm like, yes, I get to answer that same question by that same police officer 19 times this morning. But I'm extremely passionate about what doing that very well affords me to do in, in a lifestyle, but also all the extra stuff that we're not monetizing. Um, so I think that's a huge distinction that people need to really uh, come to grips with is chasing after your gifts, figuring out what you're gifted at, not what you're passionate about. Like that used to drive me crazy because it, 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 it's very discouraging for me. Because I was like, well, I don't know what I'm passionate about. I don't know what I was born to do. Like, I don't, like, how do you figure that out? Like, my dad used to always tell me, like, it's called work for a reason. Like, if it was fun, it would be a hobby. Uh, but, like, that's what I always thought. Like, you know, they say, like, what do you love to do and do that and it'll never work a day in your life. Like, that sounds great. Um, but the reality is if, if you do something and you do it well, it will give you the ability to go out and do whatever in the world you're passionate about. Um, and that will then carry over into the work that you're actually doing. Like I walk in there with passion, even though it's something that I'm not passionate about because of the fact that I know what it's providing for my family and I know what it's providing uh, for other people that I'm able to touch and impact through the stuff that we're doing online. Um, so I think that's an important distinction. Do you know how many hours or estimate that you think you worked like per week in that first year at work at selling life insurance and not any of the other stuff? Like where would you sort of put that gauge at? It's, it, I almost like wouldn't even want to say because it's like, it's so crazy. I mean, I mean each day, I mean the actual work and time in meetings is probably 16, 18, like every day. And then now it's, it's four days a week and then Fridays are like a normal type schedule because Fridays are usually the only day I'm in my office. Not yeah. so much even for myself, but it's for everybody else to recognize and see that like you made 300 grand, but you, you're putting in the work and now it's like scaling to a crazy level because there's only 24 hours in a day. There's a limit to time yeah. you can work, but you made 300 grand. You really were making the same thing as someone who makes like 50 grand, but you worked as much as five people. So you make five people so, or whatever. Mm -hmm. That was the separator in the beginning. Now you're learning how to scale it. You'll break seven figures, eight figures. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, you can't work more than 24 hours, so you just are getting better. Yeah, that's something I believe in as well. I just wanted to hear you say it or kind of. There's a phrase that I've, I've used recently. It's called condensing timelines, and I'm big on that condensing timelines. So it's this thought process of taking what a normal person would accomplish in 10 years and doing it in three or four. What a normal person would accomplish in three or four and doing it in one or two doing what a normal person would do in a year in three months. And the only way I know how to do that is by the time in the day. Um, there's ways, there's certainly ways you can get more efficient. Um, and, and my close ratio now um, is almost 100. I mean, it's like 90 something percent, um, which makes life a lot easier. But I haven't packed off the hours. That's why I've just sold more policies. Um, and you know, there's a, there's a lot of variables to that, but that idea of condensing timelines to me is now what's most important in figuring out how to level up to like, and, and there's, and I don't know how y'all structure is here, uh, but with, with our structure, like now I'm part owner of the company uh, as of like four or five months ago. Um, so that changes everything. Um, and I, like after the first year became a state manager, then a regional manager, and then the national coordinator, and now um, one, of the owner, one of the owners of the company. So like that all had enhanced compensation rates and different um, right. things like that. Yeah, 
But but yeah, but I mean, you're exactly right. Like my thing is for me, people always question when I talk about like 238 nights in a hotel last year. Like that's a real number. And that's like not a cool number and like not a cool thing to say. Like that sucks. Like <laughs> like two, there's nothing cool about being in the hotel 238 nights. Um, and my wife always gets on me now because I stay at nicer hotels now. But I still always say like it's not the Ritz Carlton that I'm staying at. <laughs> like the first year, the first year like legitimately I got bed bugs four times the first year staying in these nasty hotels. Like I didn't pay more than like $40 for a hotel because I wasn't there like I was literally taking like a three hour nap and then going right back to work so I was like I don't care it's just me by myself I'm like I don't care and I was broke and um but spending that many times not many nights in a hotel my biggest thing now is focusing on being all on and all off or another way to look at it is being all on when I'm at work and all on when I'm at home and so like Fridays were really laid back for me like I spent I, I slept in Spent time with my family, went to the office, got some stuff done, got home early, and then on the weekends, like I'm all in uh, with my family. That's it's a big thing that like I don't want people to when they hear me talk about these crazy hours and all this stuff to misunderstand is that the ability to be all on gives you the ability to be all off. I think the problem is most people are stuck in the middle, like they're not really all on at work. So when they go home, they're thinking about like what they didn't do or what they should have done or what they're going to have to catch up on next week because they didn't finish it. And so it doesn't give them the ability to be completely off. They're staring at their phone the whole time, the whole weekend, or doing all this stuff away from the family. So they're not really with the family. You're present, but you're not like available. And so that's what I'm so, so focused on now and really was from the very beginning. But now that I have a, I've got a 19-month-old, um, that obviously changes a lot of things and being very, very, very... Uh, focused just as much on the family stuff as I am on the work stuff. Um, I, I personally don't think work-life balance, like I hate that phrase because it's so different for everybody. I just don't think it exists. I just personally think you have to go all in in all those areas. I just personally hate the fact that the only people that want to talk about work-life balance are using it as an excuse to talk about how they don't want to work as much. Like that's, it's never used. You don't ever hear someone say like, oh, man, I was the best father this month like just incredible father like this whole work-life balance I gotta work more next month like I need to spend a little bit less time at home Like you don't ever hear that you always hear it in someone that wants to talk about working less I'm like if you need to be home more like be home more it doesn't mean you need to work less it may mean you need to sleep less or it may mean you need to go to less happy hours on Thursday or whatever like football league or this and that like I don't really have any other like extracurricular activities other than my family and work um, which good, bad, or indifferent, like I love, I'm super happy. Um, but I think it's a problem when people use this idea of, oh, well, you know, I gotta have this work-life balance just as an excuse to not put in full, full, full effort at work, so. So, question number two. And I appreciate, what up? Yeah. Yeah. Question, we got a few that want to ask questions. Yeah. Yeah. I need to take a restroom break. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, is, there, is there any value? <laughs> <month? laughs> You talk about not monetizing social media and you got a five year commitment you've made pretty clear. Yeah. What is your opinion of monetizing using social media in the business, right? Like I'm an insurance agent, I wanna sell using it or like I would just I'm curious of what your opinion is of it. I'm really kind of how actually really glad it. you asked that because I've been becoming more and more aware <laughs> of when I talk about not monetizing how it kind of ruffles some feathers from people that do. I don't have a s I don't have any problem with anybody that monetizes social media and all the stuff like I don't have any problem with anybody generating revenue from effort put in if they're providing real value like number one but number two I think there's a there's a way to do it and there's a way not to do it um, with my business I'm just fortunate into where I don't have to because of the people that we serve like it wouldn't help me it would actually hurt me to do it that way um, but for some, like the personal brand and the business brand, they have to mesh. Like they have to, they have to go together. Um, I think with that, you just have to be, you just have to be careful. Um, my problem in the monetization or the people that are making money online is only with the ones that have only made their money by selling other people on how to make money. Like that's the only problem. I, like I don't want to, I don't want to pay thirty-nine dollars a month 
to find out about how to go from zero to six figures in six months from a guy that's only made money selling this zero to six figure in six months program. <laughs> like, you know, like I want to, I want to talk to the guy that went from zero to six figures in six months and is then showing me that, like that, like that I get value from. But um, there's so much noise online in social media. There's so much noise. And that was the reason why I was fearful of putting myself out there and starting to document my life. And so I sat down with Gary Vaynerchuk and Andy Frisella. Um, it was at the book launch of the Ask Gary V book. And it was at Andy Frisella's uh, facility. And we paid, my business partners and I paid for this VIP um, deal where we got to meet with Gary and Andy after the event. So they spoke and did keynotes and stuff. And then we met with them afterwards. It was like 11 o'clock at night. We got one hour. Talk about whatever you want to talk about. There was me, my two business partners, and three other uh, random guys. We went in there and left two and a half hours later. And it was the most incredible conversation I've ever had. And Gary called me out on that exact same thing. He was like, you're just looking for permission because of the noise that's out there and the people that you see doing it wrong. That's why you're not trying to do it the right way because you don't want to get bundled in with that. But I think the things like we talked about already, like transparency, authenticity, telling people the truth, <laughs> I think that's the most important thing is to, that'll set you apart from the others. Because the other people that are just putting on this facade of this lifestyle and this that's not real, like it, it's, it's only going to last for so long. Like that, that stuff's all going to, you can only fake it for so long. That's what I love about the live stuff. And I love that you guys are doing live stuff. That's why I built the entire thing uh, first off on Facebook Live is because you can only fake it on live for so long. Like people tune in two, three, four times and they hear the same type message coming from you. They're like, okay, maybe this guy's actually saying what he, what he believes. Um, it's very funny if you guys remember when Instagram started the Instagram stories and you saw these accounts that were these huge like motivational accounts and you started seeing the people that ran them getting on like Instagram stories and you're like oh gosh like that's the guy that runs that page you're like ooh, and then they like very quickly got off of them and like stopped doing that stuff um, and so I think it's it's just it has to be handled professionally um, I think there's a right a right there's certainly a right way and a wrong way uh, to do it but I have when I say I don't monetize it, it is nothing against those that do. It's just, for me, it was a decision that I could just flip a switch and not have to think about it. Just flip a switch and not have to think about it. And five years was a 100% arbitrary number that came out at 1 o'clock in the morning on a Facebook Live after being in meetings all day long. And I woke up the next day, I was like, did I say five years? Okay, five years. Stuck to it. Mark, Mark had a question. Um, I want to take it back to when you first start talking about finding your niche. There's a handful of us in here that are kind of experimenting with doing stuff like that. And uh, is there a process that you go, I mean obviously there is a process, but what is your process to actually just hit it right where you want to just send your message? Like, you know, do you only deal with a certain type of life insurance and how exactly do you inform them of the importance of this and how do you get them to actually wait in line and to do this and to sit on their own time and you know deal with all that because um, that seems to be like the hardest part like people super overlook like whatever message you're trying to send and how do you how are you so effective in in doing it's that? just to steal I steal so many of Gary Vaynerchuk's terms but like the idea of this reverse engineering is so important like putting yourself in that person's shoes and receiving the message that you're giving and just like trying to like process it as they would. What is it like? What would it be like to be that person? And we just catered our message in a way that got their attention, had passion points. Like passion points for me are huge. Like passion points that you can hit and pause, stare someone in the eye. It's it's just hitting them where it, where it counts, um, and believing in the product. Like w we we use the story and and just have developed the messaging around it, but it was just trial and error. Like they, for a year and a half, sold nothing and tried. And, and it, it was changing the message, changing the message, changing how they dress, changing how they talk, changing, you know, it was just constantly improving upon these, uh, upon the messaging. But like whatever that, whatever that niche is, it's just putting yourself in their shoes. Like, even if it's just like putting yourself in like an, an age demographic, I mean, whatever that is, it's just figuring out there's 
sometimes it's not even the word that you say, but how you say it. That's, the, that's why we're so careful. I do a lot of training with our agents. And there can be something that I say in, in my presentation that works great for me, but it's horrible for somebody else because of their delivery of it. It just doesn't work. And when I hear them, we do, we're huge on role playing. That would be my biggest encouragement is just role playing. Like put yourself in that, in that person that you're trying to sell shoes and then just role play it, role play it, role play it, role play it over and over. And like we, we do it relentlessly. And it's not until we do those role plays that I hear it. And they'll say, oh, I don't do that. I don't do that. Oh, no, it doesn't come out that way. I'm like, all right, cool. Ring, ring, ring. They're like, oh, crap. Yeah. So we start role playing back and forth. I'm like, that's the problem. Like the way you said that one word made me feel extremely uncomfortable. He's like, that's what you say. I'm like, yeah, but <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I felt uncomfortable. So it's putting, putting yourself in that person's shoes um, that you're trying to sell to. But we role play. I'm sure you guys role play, but like we role play a lot. But you just show up to their establishment and that's that. Like you. We've got processes like with certain types of phone calls and then we set up these initial meetings and then group brief. Like we've got processes that we built. But all that was just built over time. People will ask that. Some, people will ask that in a way sometimes, as though like they don't have a choice. Like we know they these, these people have life insurance policies. They all have it. They've got it through their job. They've got supplemental policies from their buddy on the softball team and their their you know their cousin and the State Farm guy down the road. They've all got life insurance. They're just buying more of it because we explained to them how important it is to know that something happens that 100% they're taken care of. Um, I've never like heard of someone with your work ethic, like working that many hours. Um, what's your why, like what drives you? It's evolving. With all this social media stuff, it's evolving very, very rapidly. Um, in, the, in the first year, it was 100% money, because I was broke. <laughs> like it was just, I wanted to make a bunch of money because I wanted to get out of debt and get myself in a good financial position. I was recently remarried and just wanted to get ourselves in a good situation. Um, that that whole idea of personal responsibility, you know, it's the the analogy you've heard a million times when the cabin pressure drops in a in an airplane. They say to put the mask on first before you help others. Well, until I took care of myself, I couldn't look around and and even think about helping anybody else, no less care about helping anybody else. And so until I got my, until I took personal responsibility and got my own stuff figured out, I couldn't do that. Once I did that, then it became about helping other people do that. And a lot of times we call that going from your head to your heart. Um, but it, for me, it became not just what I could generate, but what I could help other people generate. And that's like with the recruiting stuff, like I love being a part of that recruiting process because I love seeing someone come through it like reminds me of what happened with me. Like I love seeing someone come in and then they're super successful. Like there's a guy that just beat me in this competition. And as I said that, my stomach literally just got into knots. So I literally, I just took second place in this competition. And um, man, I literally don't like talking about that. But this guy beat me, but I recruited him. Like he saw, he saw an Instagram, um, or he saw an Instagram message or, or an Instagram post like at one in the morning and sent me a DM and was like, what kind of life insurance is this that you're selling? like on a random Tuesday. I just happened to respond. And now he works for us and beat me in this freaking competition. But for, but for me to watch, yeah, well, for me to watch that is like the coolest thing for me. Like I love, I love that experience now. And so this social media really opened my eyes. Like the idea that someone could watch content and get value from it and actually have it enhance their life is just crazy to me. Um, but I've seen it happen. And like when that first message or that first post that I did, my wife was mortified. I was like, give me six months. Over those next few months, when I would get a message or I would get you know, a DM, something, I would screenshot it and I'd text it to her. I'd screenshot it and I'd show it to her that night. I'd screenshot it and I'd like show her a bunch that weekend. And it didn't, you know, it didn't take long to where these messages started coming in that were like life-changing messages, like crazy stuff, like stuff that you wouldn't even expect. Like I don't even talk about like health and fitness stuff. And, I remember the first time I got this message from a guy that was saying that like he saw me doing something with like prepping my meals for the week and and now he's been doing that for six months and he's off insulin and doesn't have diabetes anymore and I'm like what like I don't even talk about like fitness stuff um, but as these messages started coming in it like opened my eyes and I think about like everyone always talks ask Gary Vaynerchuk they're always like you know how, how do you have so much energy how are you so like just nonstop like just like a million miles an hour and I'm like well he's getting those messages every 
two seconds. Like he's getting a thousand of them a day. Like how would you not wake up in the morning in a full sprint uh, if you're impacting people's lives? So that's what it's changed to for me. And um, and giving. I mean, uh, we give a lot. My my, fam- my wife and I we give a lot. Um, so that's always. But that's always I gave on unemployment. So. <laughs> Um, that's always been a part of what we've done. Uh, now it's just a lot more fun <laughs> to do it. <laughs> yes. What keeps you so humble? Um, the fact that it was three and a half years ago. That's really the most humble way I can answer that, <laughs> because it's true. Like, like I was trying to explain it to some the other day. I was like, it was someone that was going through a struggle. I was like, man, it was the, it was the live, we did a live Q and A which was the coolest thing we've ever done um, on the Sales Rules podcast that I do. We did a live Q&A the other day, it was just me. And we had people comment uh, with a question and then we uh, DM'd them for their phone number and this one guy calls uh, from the UK, his name is Dean. It was, like a, it was the most incredible conversation. Uh, this guy was like in tears at the end. We talked for like a, a while. And, um, and in that, he asked me this question. He was like, well, what about the average Joes? Like, like, like what about the guy that like doesn't really think he has like a lot of you know, abilities, like, but wants to get better and level up. And, and I was ex- trying to explain to him, like, look, like, this was three and a half years ago that I was in horrible shape, like, like in a lot of debt and completely broke and broken just as a human being. And this is all like, yeah, it's happened really fast, but there's been so many things that have happened to where, like, I still know what that feels like. Like, I still remember it like it was yesterday. Um, and, and for me, it's just like keeping that feel like I always want to feel like I always want to remember what that feels like, because it's what is going to enable me not to go back there, (laughs) number one, but it's, it's what enables me to have a conversation with someone, which is my passion. That's going through that. Like someone that's going through that right now, like I, I can, I, I can feel that desperation or that feeling like, like they have no way out. Um, and to be able, that's like, that's my ultimate goal is to be able to reach someone in that and just give them just like a little, a little spark, maybe that little pivot they need to make that little mindset switch. Like that's what happened with that guy on the phone. Like there was just this, it was about that, that gifts versus passion. Like at the end of the conversation, I was like, man, does that help in any way? And he's got this like British accent and it was just so awesome. He was just like, well, he's like, it's like, it's quite, it's quite life changing actually. He's like, you just, he's like, I've, he's like, it's just changed the way I look at everything. He's like, this is, he's like, this is one of the most impactful conversations. And like, it's just so cool to be able to have that because I knew what that guy was feeling. It's like, it wasn't that long ago. So that's, that's my whole thing is like, there's, there's l- like, when I tell people there's nothing special about me, like, there's no, like, <laughs> there's really nothing special. It's just work really hard. Like anybody can work really hard. Um, that's the exciting thing. That's what I want to. That's the message I want to get out there because that's the message that's not getting out there on social media. All social media wants to tell you is how easy it is, and buy this course, and buy this mastery class, and sign up for this whatever funnel I'm going to stick you in and email you ten times a day, and you'll be successful in a year or whatever. Like there is no easy. There's n- nothing, nothing impactful, nothing significant will ever be easy, um, and that's why it is. Awesome. I got one question. Um, does TJ live with you? Um, <laughs> common law, is that? <laughs> <laughs> this common law marriage, right? Tyler Harris. <laughs> and if you guys want while he's up here, maybe we can uh, everyone get him on an Instagram story. We're pretty cool. Yes. You guys want to do that? Tag Tyler Harris. Hey. Thank you so much, man. That's awesome. Awesome. Spoke for almost two hours nonstop without a break, man. Thank you so much, Tyler and TJ, man. Thank you. And if you guys don't know, this is American Ninja Warrior right here. If he looks familiar, you saw him on NBC doing backflips on uh, Mount Hiroshima. How long ago was that? That was close. That was was last time I was here in life. He really is, though. Is he familiar? Yeah, Yeah, look. (laughs) 